Okay, welcome back. I think we'll get started as some people trickle in. Uh, so my name is Diane Archer. I'm a senior research fellow at SEI here in Bangkok, and I'm delighted to lead today a session uh, looking at urban futures in a changing climate, focusing on the Mekong region. Uh, today's session will start with a brief uh, recorded presentation from a participant who unfortunately couldn't join us in person. And then we'll have a dialogue uh, with our three uh, in-person panelists. Um, and then some time for questions. So um, I'm sure you're very aware that the Mekong region is becoming increasingly urban over the coming decades. Um, and so we need to prepare our towns and cities for both slow and rapid onset uh, climate impacts. This has implications for things like provision of affordable housing, infrastructure, services, as well as health and well-being in cities. So we'll try and consider some of these issues um, to see how we can achieve more resilient cities that are also inclusive of um, uh, everyone uh, in the city. So uh, to kick off our session, we have a recorded presentation from Dr. Jen Bin Wang, who's based in Australia. Um, he's the Chief Innovation Officer at Water Sensitive Cities um, at Monash University. Um, where he is promoting multifunctional infrastructure and applies circular economy approaches to deliver water sensitive city visions. Uh, so let's uh, ha start with that presentation. Thank you. The opportunity uh, for me to share some of the uh, climate resilient perspective in urban context. Um, one of the key messages I'm trying to deliver today is that uh, we all have to uh, integrate social inclusion into the climatic response uh, so that we can build a foundation for a shared pro prosperity and leave no one behind. And one of the ways that we can go about doing that is to develop multifunctional public open space. And because it's a multifunctional, it can deal with multiple climate scenarios and therefore deliver multiple benefits to the community. And why I made that point is because the climate change doesn't mean the old problems will simply go away. We still have to deal with you know, water pollution, drought, scarcity, you know, urban floods, river degradation, and urban heat. And we don't want to create a one-dimensional solution because that would just shift the problems from one to another. For example, in the old days, the engineers trying to concretize uh, rivers uh, to improve the drainage efficiency, but at the cost of losing biodiversity. So what we want to do is to develop a holistic approach to deal with all these challenges, because they all somehow relate to how we manage water in a city. And of course, with the introduction of climate change, uh, things are going to exacerbate for example, the high intensity rainfall will lead to more severe urban flooding. And we're also going to get compounding events. For example, you know, sea level rise could be coupled with coastal flooding, and extended drought could be coupled with urban heat. And on top of all of that, we have to deal with the uncertainty, because both drought and flood could occur in the same city, and sometimes in the same year. Right? So all of that is pointing towards a direction that is calling for a multifunctional infrastructure that is embedded in the public open space. So for the rest of this presentation, I'll simply refer that as a multifunctional public open space. You may wonder why multifunctional public open space will help facilitate social inclusion into the climate response. Um, I'd like to draw your attention to this diagram produced by Workman. It says that the most relevant stack of social inclusion can be classed under three domains, the market, services, and space. So if you think about our proposition of developing multifunctional public open space, it means that the multifunctionality will deliver a multiple ecosystem services and therefore benefits. And because it is, is within the public open space, it can ensure the services and the benefits will reach all communities. 
So all we need to do is to make sure the social inclusion is well implemented through better design so that everyone can take part and participate in the society. So let me give you an example of what we mean by a multifunctional public open space. Here is a minimal version of that, which is an urban tree pit in Melbourne. So how this works is that the tree pit is actually sunken down from the road surfaces and there's cut openings on the side so that every time it rains, the stormwater generated from the road surface will flow into the tree pit first. The water gets attenuated on the, on the surface before the water slowly percolates downwards through the soil, through the root systems, before the clean water gets picked up by the stormwater pipe. So in the process, basically, we get a better and healthier uh, tree roots. Why? Because every time it rains, the tree will get a drink, which we refer as a passive irrigation. And also the nutrients that is contained in storm water is going to be retired and recycled for the tree growth, nitrogen and phosphorus, and so on. And once we get a, a better root system, we're going to get a much better camel piece. Right? And if you line up whole street, which is such tree peat, we'll get a much better canopy shading and therefore microclimate improvement in the streetscape and also improve amenity. And basically, you know, those multiple benefits we just mentioned about is going to benefit all the communities who live along the street or anyone walked along the street. And that was a simple example from Australia. Uh, so for the rest of this presentation, I'm going to walk you through a number of case studies in a developing country context, for example, China and Thailand, to give you the confidence that the multifunctional public open space can be built, it can be built really well. Here you see a, a civic plaza with constructed wetlands in the city of Kunzhai in China. So what we have done in this project is to incorporate a range of constructed wetlands within this public plaza. Uh, so that every time it rains, the plants that run off actually flow into the wetland first. Water get attenuated, water get treated before the clean water discharge in the nearby canal. And in the dry days, those wetlands is used to maintain a large ornamental pool, which you see on the top right, to maintain its water quality through recirculation, very much like a dialysis system so that there's no potable water required to support this water feature. Everything's done through surface water. A really interesting in this project is that we have not developed an engineering solution, but rather we have created a very unique ecological landscape, a blend well from the rest of the public open space. As you can see here, the wetland turned out to be a mini aquatic botanic garden, and, and we're able to bring the biodiversity back into the city. So all the communities who have access to this public plaza will benefit from a range of ecosystem services provided by this wetland. So there's an important message I'd like to pause and highlight, uh, which is the climate resilience do not just focus on buildings. In fact, it should go beyond the buildings and look into the public open space because that's where the investment is going to benefit the vulnerable and disadvantaged groups in the society. And the beauty of this is, is the pub, public uh, space, when it's contained in multifunctionalities, you know, it actually become completely scalable. We can do this from street scale to the precinct scale and all the way to the city scale. So let me walk you through a further few case studies to demonstrate this point. So what you see here is Kunshan Forest Park. It's a 200 hectare park that used to be just a forest park with large lakes in it. And the lakes used to be isolated from the rest of the city because they were down pollution and contamination. Uh, what we have done to the project is to introduce a range of constructed wetlands into the park so that the wetland will use to maintain the water quality in those lakes such that the lake can be reconnect back to the, the city river network 
So it can participate in the large flood mitigation schemes because we know the water quality of the lake can be restored uh, post events. And the, the beauty of this is that we also work with the local landscape architects to introduce a very sophisticated uh, a network of pedestrian systems so that we bring people back to this nature capitalism. Everyone can get access to this beautiful forest and wetland park and, and enjoy the day to day lives. And a recent study by the World Bank shows the benefit cost ratio for the forest park is 2.7, which means that every dollar invested by the Christian government into the park is going to generate $2.7 back in terms of economic benefits to the whole society. And what you see here is a multifunctional city corridor uh, in the same city, city of Kunshan, along a 40 kilometer long elevated ring road. We call this a gray, green and blue corridor, where gray is for traffic and green is for ecology and landscape and blue is for water. So how this works is that every time it rains, the water generated from the green corridor will discharge into the wet ends within the green corridor first. The water gets attenuated and treated before the clean water discharge into the blue corridor, which is the river. And during extreme flood events, the water level in the blue corridor will start to rise, now inundate part of the green corridors to increase the flood attenuation capacity, will also increase the flood conveyance capacity of the city. And because the green corridor and, and the blue corridor is a linear, so Every community is live in the live in the vicinities. Uh, they can benefit from them either through a commute, when a commute, or, or through some recreational use. So under the auspices of Australian government, we have been applying the learnings that we gain in in, in China and apply that to to the Mekong regions, for example. This is one of the efforts we're trying to build climate resilience for the city of Ryan. Uh, as you can see, there's a very classic image of Ryan that's looking into a secondary street, very harsh, all concrete, no trees. And the city suffer from a combination of urban heat, uh, in the flooding because of lack of drainage, and then combined sewer overflows. So what we propose to do is to, to transform this harsh urban environment into a green Kenya by populating the streetscape with tree peas and store water planted box. So how this work is that the roof runoff will travel down to the dump pipe but intercepted by the storm water planted box where water gets attenuated, treated and harvested, recycled and to support the planters, which is part of the streetscape amenities. And, and then the street runoff will flow into the tree pit, very much function as the Melbourne tree pit that I mentioned earlier. So the combination of this initiative will start to uh, to help reduce the combined sewer flows because we start to effectively separate stormwater from the wastewater. And in doing so, the trees and planter box are passively irrigated and they start to dramatically influence the microclimate in, in this urban environment. And if we're not smart enough, we can start to integrate a range of urban furnitures into the tree pit and, and the planter box, such as dining tables, chairs, and benches, to improve the amenities for the communities living in the vicinity. And then hopefully, you know, the, the government will build it one day. All right, so this is my last slide, uh, which we're back to the city of Kunshan, looking at the Sponge City demonstration park. So what the government have done is to transform what used to be uh, underutilized a rubbish dumping ground underneath this electricity corridor into a very nice park. The park is designed to be floodable and with a lot of water quality improvement systems in the park. More importantly, it integrates a lot of interactive water features so that it, it, it starts to bring the amenities back to the nearby community. And, and what we see in this project is that it gives us a lot to think about uh, when we talk about building urban resilience. We do not do not just focus on the beautiful uh, city centers, but also looking into the marginal areas, those, those vulnerable groups, 
and give us a lot to think about where to start this process and how social inclusion play a role in the process so that we leave no one behind in this journey. So, um, so with that, I thank you very much for your time and I wish you all the best in the panel discussion and the rest of the conference. Uh, Coburn Crowd. Great. Um, it was lovely to have that introduction and the city of Kunshan certainly looks like it's got some lovely parks um, and I think we can always do with more green space in our cities. So now we will uh, shift to our panelists here. Uh, so I will first introduce them and then we'll work our way through a round of questions. So uh, we have Mr. Anuksai uh, Pomalat. Uh, who is a freelance consultant on environment and social safeguarding, gender, climate change, and DRR, and land, ma land management. Um, and he currently works on regional land use planning, spatial analysis, and is the Lao PDR focal person with Rumble as an environmental specialist for the second strengthening higher education project at Savannakhet University, a uh, new campus construction funded by the ADB. Beside him, we have Kun Somsuk Bunya Bancha, uh, chairperson of the Asian Coalition for Housing Rights, or ACHR, an organization working on urban poor housing development in Asia. Kun Somsuk, uh, I, it was actually my first boss. I worked at ACHR after my PhD. Uh, so it's great to have her back. And um, Kun Somsuk was also the director of Community Organizations Development Institute, or CODI, from 2000 to 2008 here in Thailand, and is still the chairperson on CODI's National Slum Upgrading Committee. And finally, we have uh, Ms. Chom Thieu, uh, who is pr program manager of the ASEAN SDGs Frontrunner Cities Program, which is one of ASEAN's flagship regional platforms supporting innovative bottom-up actions by green cities, um, reporting annually to ASEAN environmental ministers. Shom has spent over a decade managing grants, technical assistance, and networking city services for ASEAN's frontrunner cities. So we have a nice mixed panel here today, so I'll get us started. Uh, firstly, with Kun Somsuk. So Kun Somsuk, you have spent many decades working with urban low-income community groups in the Mekong region who are trying to improve their housing and access to services using their own funds and resources. How can governments continue to work with them better in this process? And is there a role for the private sector, do you think? Okay. Well, I, I, I will speak from my experience as uh, the person who actually support the work in Asia and in Thailand. Uh, in Asia, we used to support this uh, urban community development process from the ground up from the bottom up uh, to link with the city and the other agency and to develop a citywide approach in the Asia countries as well as in Thailand. Thailand now we support the community, urban poor community or even rural community to work with the, with the city and the ward, uh, the provincial government and so on. So to answer Diane's question, I would say that in, in the process in which I work in, in the region as well as in the country, we look at the people as the center, the community as active actor. Uh, you see so many countries in the world where they have housing policy, but the housing policy from top down may reach up to a certain level, except when we start looking at the poor people themselves and trying to see how to make them visible uh, group in the society and they are active and they are part of uh, the change making. Yeah? So people center and find a way that people become the active actor. People, people become the focus of whatever assistance and link, uh, find a way to link them together into a network and from the network, you link with the other uh, support organization, the civil society, the institution in the, in, in, in the city, and also the city government. Building a coalition, a coalition of uh, uh, community, 
uh, support organization and the city government and to make them visible, to make them active, uh, to find a way that community themselves have the information and they are the one who have uh, active action. They have the passion to lead the physical change. Yeah. If people become active actor and they make the move together at scale, uh, we support the people to uh, to make uh, uh, a change from them at the city scale, in, we, in which we call citywide, uh, citywide upgrading and uh, citywide change. When it is the citywide, which is a scale. Uh, uh, of, of the poor, huh? uh, so many community, all the poor in the city get together with sitting with the government, sitting with the other. It become a system change. It's, it become a system change. It's not just a welfare approach, a very politic welfare activity. A little bit here, a little bit there, no relationship, and and then it dies. Huh? So it, it's very important that it continue, it link, and People also learn and they make the move with the support of the um, maybe civil society or the, the organization. We have the institution here in Thailand called CODI, Community Organization Development Institute, in which we institutionalize the people-driven approach. Yeah. Start from the people, start the survey, how many of them, get them to sit together to understand their situation, their condition, make a plan, start the saving, mapping, and start the work. And then when they are a little stronger, uh, we start linking with the government, city government and many other. And at the end, at the end of the day, it becomes a sort of a joint uh, mechanism between the city, between the development institution and the people at the scale of the city. Yeah. To, to sit together. So once uh, we able to bridge the people process and the government system to be more collaborative, you have a new kind of politics. You're entering new kind of politics where uh, the people power, the government power, the knowledge power are able to come together. And, and then the realistic problem of the people like bad housing situation, eviction, uh, no money for this and that will be brought into the platform and little by little when they talk together people will develop the knowledge and the negotiation power and the government will also learn because if we start the the approach by just uh, asking the government in Asia in, in the Mekong region uh, to be more inclusive which is something that we, we we commonly under, un, uh, understood. I think that from all the government I know, a city government I know in Mekong region, uh, they would simply not understanding how to do it, no? Or they don't, they are not interested to do it, sorry to say. <laughs> Vietnam also, uh, Laos also. Uh, uh, sometimes they have good intention, but they, they, they don't know how to do it. And they're a little afraid of the uh, poor community. They don't know what is inside and they're afraid of the, the demand huh, from the people. Uh, so they have to learn that people are the answer. People are the solution. Yeah? And then uh, the, the urban poor housing condition could be better. Climate resilience could be better. Only we center the people as the answer and, and bring the people into an active actor of the process. So people are the, the answer, and, but we need to know how to work on that. It's not just people, just a few persons to come into the, the process and uh, participate with the government program. It needs to be organized as a group of community. It needs to, to have a continued process. It needs to be inclusive, even in any given community, that everybody is a part of that. Uh, and, 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 and have confidence, have plan, have information to move forward, yeah? So we need professional. We need professional and knowledge how to support this change process, yeah? 
I work with the government. I know uh, the government way of doing, you know, in, in most of the Mekong region in Thailand also. We, we develop the institution that uh, we are uh, top down. Yeah, we have the culture of rules, regulation, and you got to follow rules and regulation. Society have changed. Society have changed. We need a little more understanding how how to open up and how to build uh, the the possibility and the process in which people become a part of the change mechanism. And in doing so, they are growing. They are stronger. And they are a part of the uh, whatever mechanism the government may may develop about, and and we develop this citywide where we map all the slum communities, and they build a network, and they propose uh, which community would go first, and then we support the budget, <laughs> support the budget. This is very important. Most of the budget in our society are top-down budget. Yeah? Budget to the government organization is uh, the, the resource in which the people have to follow the government instruction. No? No? Uh, we need the kind of budget that would allow more participation, more collaboration, so that everybody have a role to be a part of. In the CODI process and the ACHR, we pass the budget to community and let them be the owner of the project. Uh, we send architects huh, to work with the community to make change with them uh, and, and with the city as well. And now we have all the city uh, committee where the, the city authority, community network, uh, the civil society, the architect, the professor are all sitting together. I think that is the kind of direction that we should look and we can find several possible answer for housing, for climate change, for environmental development, or even quality of life. Great. Thank you, Kun Som Sok. I think uh, I have seen for myself the possibilities um, that is offered by this sort of people-driven approach that isn't just top-down, but is networked as well. And it's about engaging all the relevant stakeholders at city level. So um, now I will move on to Mr. Anuksai. Um, from your experience working in Laos on the new town developments, can you explain uh, some of your experiences of successes and challenges in terms of trying to ensure a more inclusive urban governance approach? Uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I uh, really uh, great to uh, be here and also to uh, discuss uh, and share what I have done uh, regarding for uh, urban development, particularly for the urban town in the small town and poor town like in, in Lao Pida. Some of us here might have a chance to visit in Lao. You will see that it's, uh, in Lao for the uh, small town, it's very limit of the, uh, we call it uh, the public space. So even there was no uh, walkway, <laughs> you will use just only the luxury car to go everywhere and motorbikes. So that is uh, one of thing. And the another is also uh, the uh, environmental issue in the urban town. There are so many that is happen. So I was one of the team who uh, support for the uh, urban town. I will give you some example that uh, what what we did uh, to provide the uh, better in, uh, urban environment to the uh, town. So the uh, project that uh, support uh, this, we also include uh, to uh, improve for the uh, urban infrastructure like road, uh, increase more space for the park, and as the space for the uh, community, for the uh, uh, citizenship in the town. And we also uh, increase uh, as much as possible for the uh, space for the uh, park in, 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 in the urban area. 
and we also uh, to include to solve the uh, issue of the uh, wash water from the household level. Uh, this one that uh, we used the uh, decentralized uh, wash water treatment system. However, this even when we call is a uh, de decentralized, but uh, actually it's not uh, decentralized because just only <laughs> the uh, one location that is uh, make uh, for the uh, wash water treatment for the town. So uh, basically, if uh, decentralized should be uh, is coming from east of the household. <laughs> so. <laughs> Uh, this one is, we also try to soap. However, it's not the really soap at the root cause of the wash water, but it's a we soap soap uh, end cause of of the problem before the least uh, this was of was what water to the uh, Mekong. And we also uh, to uh, support for the uh, waste management, particular for the uh, Soviet waste and including for the uh, uh, flood uh, protection uh, in previous section also discuss uh, what are uh, exactly <laughs> they uh, try to uh, make a uh, fast protection or to avoid for the uh, or mitigate from the uh, flooding because in this area uh, it's what what we call is like a prolonged uh, flooding so it's like the seasonal flooding every year is flooding uh, uh, but a person who live in those area is quite uh, poor because they don't have uh, uh, enough investment to buy the land where it's a uh, <laughs> quite high price and also uh, good uh, condition so this area is a uh, regular frost so this that's why project to uh, introduce the uh, uh, concept that uh, to uh, make a water gate and also uh, pumping the water out during the rainy season and also to stock the water for the uh, from from the uh, treatment and for the farmer that they can do uh, agriculture in in the rice season and for the uh, waste management we also support and provide the facility uh, as the landfill uh, construction and also including for the uh, rigid treatment system and also have a compost and recyclable. However, on of this, as I already mentioned previously, we not really soap at the root cause. We soap at the <laughs> end of the problem. It's not exactly that uh, we, we go and then to, to soap uh, where it originates of uh, this issue. And together on this, that is uh, quite a uh, challenge that uh, how to engage uh, people who participate in the uh, project and to be uh, to benefit of uh, this uh, people here who have a chance to visit Savannah Kate, you may uh, found that uh, Savannah Kate is one of the uh, area of the city in, in, in La Pita have a uh, quite a beautiful uh, embankment uh, park if compared to like the other because uh, this design is not uh, originally from uh, just only environmental perspective but it's coming from uh, the consultation with the uh, community in the area they recom uh, strongly recommend if need to make the uh, park or embankment it must be that is multi multiple benefits to the community because not only just only this is uh, for protect of the uh, flooding during the uh, uh, extremely uh, even like the uh, water high, but it should be more other function for the uh, community and make it more beautiful. So you you can see the uh, previous uh, 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 photo. That is the the location where is a uh, space for the community for the children that they can play together. And we also uh, provide some uh, exercise equipment as the, for the public uh, that they can use, they can play, and then people can run around there. And for one of the key challenge of uh, this, 
that I found that uh, we try to uh, solve so far is just only solve at not ex exactly like the uh, the root cause of the problem, as I already mentioned. For example, like the waste management, uh, water uh, waste management. But uh, however, that uh, what we can do right now just only try to make it the best as uh, possible. Uh, that what what we can do so far, and basically we also in, integrate the other dimension into this uh, support. For example, awareness raising to try to encourage more people to understand about the uh, waste and to uh, understand the uh, root cause of this and how to solve it. But sometimes it's not an easy uh, to to start with it. But for the polluted, it's happened right now. But how to to stop uh, some certain issue that we have to decide to to solve, even if it's not exactly the the right point, but we have to do it. So uh, for the other challenge for uh, operation and maintenance, uh, one thing that is also related to the uh, go government who uh, make a decision to uh, operate on of infrastructure that uh, project provide. That one also uh, still lack of uh, encourage the uh, society how to engage and cooperate for the uh, operation and maintenance as well. So this is also one of the key challenge how to uh, sustain of the urban town and how to ensure that uh, urban town is sustainable and to to facilitate uh, this we, we also found that uh, right now we also uh, face uh, some issue for in uh, the waste management in La Vida as well yeah so I just stop uh, this point and uh, for thank you thank you and thank you for sharing the photos as well and for highlighting that um, whilst uh, some solutions are being implemented uh, there are still there's still a way to go to really address some of the challenges right at their root cause um, to help uh, the urban development. So um, another key challenge that we find in urban contexts is how to get climate finance um, down to the ground level, like Kun Somsuk mentioned as well. How can we get local governments and local communities to uh, access the funds when they're best placed to um, identify and implement necessary interventions. Ms. Shom, could you maybe speak to this? Um, yes, I don't have slides. So again, like Ms. Shom, I'll just share what my observations are. So I think the fundamental problem here is I'm, I don't know how long this has been going on. Ms. Shom will know that basically there's a mismatch between what we say is important to support and how much of the funds and financing actually go to where it matters the most, which is to the local level, the local authorities, the communities, the civil society. Yeah. So, um, and at the moment, it remains that for all of these important high level talks related to climate, um, non state actors, including including the city governments themselves, they, they are not part of the national government. So they, they basically do not have a voice or any official decision making or contribution to all these negotiations. As well as in the, let's say right now, the world is talking about we need to mobilize um, 10 trillion or billions of funds to the, the global funds, the UN agencies, to the multilateral development banks. So where are the non-state and the local level actors in all of these funds governing mechanisms does, does not seem to exist. So I guess I'm not sure. It, it seems obvious as a, because in my position, um, I am dealing directly with the city governments as well as the national agencies, which they are, let's say, they are more open and more receptive to bringing the resources down to the local level. So in fact, they advocate that. And um, however, it still remains. So if there's anyone in the audience from that level 
of decision making maybe you can share so why is it that um why is it that 90 percent i think some literature suggests that five percent or at least not more than 15 percent of the total pi public um climate finance and also development finance in general only five to ten percent will flow to the local level so there's a lot of complaints actually in the in the ASEAN community which I work with that there's too much events, too much workshops, too much on writing reports and research. Of course, these are very important, right? But they are also, we need to balance that. We need to balance that part of the work with the actual actions taken. In fact, we may need to prioritize actions and what we need to achieve now for the transformation and for the challenge that we are going to face, we need to have actually many, 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 many um, cases of local actions slowly and in the long term, developing the capacity and basically just doing what the, the theories and the reports are telling us to do. Yeah, so th this is one thing that I want to share in response to your questions. Great, thank you so much. Um, and um, maybe that now uh, we can move on to um, thinking about uh, climate resilience specifically. Um, so if we're looking at urban climate resilience, Kun Somsuk, how can we try and be more inclusive of low-income communities and support them in integrating climate resilience into their housing developments, infrastructure developments? You already touched a bit on this, but maybe very briefly, is there anything else you would like to add? We're running out of time, so we'll be quick on this round. See, I, I think it's really important to be more earlier based, yeah? Which is definitely right to focus on a city based. City based, ward based, community based, community maybe neighborhood based, you know? You know? Because when we focus on the earlier base, we include everything. We include every element. We include the poor, we include the rich, we include the business sector, we include the environment, we include everything, yeah? So the key point is to be more earlier based and get everybody to be involved and, and change the, the manner in which when we, in, in our society, we, we have the, the system like this, government, central government, local government, private sector, and things like that. No? You only have to change it into like this, right? That everybody could sit together right? and, and, and see the reality reality of thing on the ground and chair, yeah? And, and then find the answer and, and let the people, let the development sector, the private sector, whoever, uh, to take part and, and put together the effort uh, of uh, managing everything. Do, uh, I mean, selecting something easier to achieve and, and, and go more and more to more difficult. So in this way, it's like we, we try to equip uh, the neighborhood, the community, the poor, as part of the, uh, the, the, the city development process. When we develop the citywide approach, we start by surveying all the community in the city, either it's a squatter, either it's the uh, rental communities, uh, the rental room, whatever, no? and then uh, uh, invite them into a process to see how we could plan and, and link with the city, link with the land authority, whatever, and, and, and see how we little by little would find a way to collaborate and to develop the solution in which people have to do a lot of homework. You have to do a saving so your finance would start moving. Uh, you got to have information. You, they need to check what are the uh, other social issues, you know, all kinds of uh, work. Community have to do something, the city have to do something, uh, the uh, different organizations have to do something. So it's a challenging work, a challenging work and a challenging uh, development process in which if you have some success uh, or a good project happen, everybody will be a part of that success. 
is not scattered as one project there, one activity over there, and no relationship. So the earlier base will be able to link up things together, link up the actor together, and try to see how every party could be a part of the possible development process in a more holistic picture. I think that it's all so simple, no? uh, but uh, in, in most of the city, it, it's not this picture. Uh, so I, uh, the, the point is that uh, we link this into a more communal process, a more holistic process. This is a chair power. Uh, and I, 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 I say that chair power because uh, in the existing system of any city, any uh, Mekong region, country, or whatever, it's not, uh, it's not the right kind of chair power to make things happen. If things are going to happen, it happens because of some kind of power. You either have financial power or you have the authoritative power. But the authoritative power is top down. Money uh, power is come from the private sector to invest this and that and make a lot of scattered development. Huh? So if we link people to to be in the same picture and chair and everybody know what's going to happen and, and how to really plan, how to rethink, really how to get everybody involved is a chair power. Once a chair, a chair power is possible, then a chair development will be possible and everybody will be inclusive in different manner. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, I think the area-based approach is really a, a great concept for trying to get a really inclusive approach to urban development. Um, Ms. Chong, could we maybe think about this kind of inclusive approach to a transition to low-carbon cities? Do you have any suggestions? Uh, well, yeah, so low-carbon development and low-carbon cities, usually they are, you know, they're dealt as a different stream from resilience city or adaptation or others so um well let's say uh, if low carbon city is realized it can there are potential for the society the marginalized group to have better quality of life and well-being um let's say um if we change the infrastructure the buildings the transport the um industrial process to be cleaner and to be based on clean, clean fields, then air pollution will reduce. Uh, there will be also much more greening kinds of uh, projects. So that benefits everyone. Um, then there's also the lifestyle and value change that is happening in low carbon uh, cities. So it means closing the material loops, meaning changing the food production system, which currently is very, very, very wasteful. Um, for example, um, dealing with the, the waste and then separating it at source, turning it into compost, as we heard from the session in, in about food security, that will generate new jobs. And usually these jobs can um, benefit the uh, low, lower income groups because usually these jobs are seen as not, uh, yeah, not classy, not prestigious. Yes. So... These are some of the examples that it will benefit. But then um, I think there's not enough discussion about the upstream and downstream effects of low carbon cities. Because if we really have that low carbon model implemented, it means we will have a lot more demand for metals and resources to have the solar panels, wind turbines, and the um, batteries. So these actually have terrible effects on wherever the mining is going on. So by some estimates, by 2050, let's say, we, uh, we, we electrify um, the energy systems, the transport. I think I've read estimates that we need five times more metals <laughs> than what is the currently uh, available amount from the current level of mining operations. And also, we have not talked about the impact of all these uh, disposal of these um, solar panels and other all this electronic and hazardous waste. This this is a long term issue. We need to pay attention more. Thank you. And I think often uh, those who are most exposed to the hazardous impacts of um, waste products are uh, low income groups who are working in waste sorting jobs. 
Um, speaking of health, Mr. Anuksai, could you briefly talk about any uh, work you have done around the health impacts of climate change in cities in Laos? Uh, thank you. Yes. Uh, basically, uh, this uh, health, I look in a uh, different way what we are looking. Because if we look the health uh, as the hospital service, so that another dimension that absolutely that is not the health of what uh, the perception that I'm looking because the health of the uh, people and society in the uh, context of the climate change how to make the city become uh, more uh, quick green space uh, and then space must be available and inclusive for all and everyone that people can do exercise and then when there is a space, so can generate more about the uh, social space. People gathering, people are uh, joining exercise together and then mental health also be good. And the dimension of the environmental health in the city must be uh, as the priority uh, that uh, to how to solve the uh, uh, was what uh, water, how to solve the uh, solid waste, and also solve the uh, problem issue that uh, what uh, the project that I already introduced. For example, if uh, occur the uh, flooding, <laughs> always this is all generate the uh, issue to the health of the uh, uh, community and uh, effective person. So if we can deal this and we can improve the uh, urban city more environmentally and more space for the uh, people, so. Uh, the health of the people and community will be better than uh, just focus on hospital. Yes, I think um, environmental health is very much linked to the health of urban residents. So we have about six minutes left, so I would like to open it up to the floor if anyone has any points they would like to add or questions for our speakers. I know we have some urban climate resilience specialists in the room. Do we have a microphone? Thank you. Uh, Abhijay, Independent Development Specialist. Uh, maybe the question more to Shom, because you work with ASEAN, no? I mean, I know that ASEAN has uh, so many city kind of projects or initiatives. Right? You have the ASEAN Smart Cities Network. It has a uh, ASEAN Sustainable Urban Strategy, and, and you know, you, you know all these. But then, in your experience and exposure to them, I mean, how helpful have they been to respond to, let's say, the needs on the ground? I mean, after all, ASEAN always talks about, oh, we are covering 650 million people poor or rich or whatever, you know, and an urban area is another important area and so forth. Or maybe any of the other speakers who may wish to chip in. Thank you. Can, um, Kun Apichai, can you uh, clarify a bit more? How, how, how effective or how beneficial have they been? Uh, is that your question? Yeah, yeah. Basically, uh -huh. I mean, you know, yes. Athen was created to, 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 to you know, uh, help, you know, develop mm. uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the whole region right the yes, 10 countries yes. and also to address any of the problems right mm -hmm. including urban problems and how about urban and then now with urban you know intersecting with climate intersecting with you know uh you know air or pollution or water pollution or yes. whatever right yes so and they and they, they give out awards right every year yes, this right. environment of same city give out awards so yes. what, what, what and how 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 do they you know help them or is there is there some incentives uh, or, or what you know in other words i want to know what mm -hmm. is the scorecard of <laughs> ASEAN on this <laughs> um yeah i'm not i'm not aware of any scorecard but first as the point i mentioned the the funds that actually flow to the ASEAN cities Kun Apichai, it's not i'm i can I, I don't have the figures but my observation it's not 50 percent it's not it's not 40 percent it's 
So very minority of the projects actually provide the grants or project funds to the city level. And sometimes um, these funds also flow to the communities that work closely with the city government. So I would say, um, yes, can, I cannot say how beneficial, but they are beneficial. And um, they, I think the strategy is like, we don't realistically expect a regional organization like ASEAN to be able to help all the cities. So we need to strategize. We need to target the top 10 or 20% of the front runner cities. And we need to give the scarce resources that we have already to them. So um, I think more and more we see greater recognition of the need to have projects for the cities. But the thing is, what is still not moving is that the funding sources and the funders, they have not yet translated this demand into the supply. Yeah, this this is, I'm not sure. I think you have a longer uh, perspective than me, but ever since I have been involved, it has almost been the same. 90% <laughs> of the funding and technical assistance is not in the form of ground projects. Yeah. So we need to, if we want to solve this problem, we really need to know why, right? We really need to know why this happens. And if we accept that, okay, this will never change, then we need to think about where are the alternative sources of uh, funding. It cannot come from uh, public climate finance. It must be from private, you know, private sources, philanthropy or crowdfunding. So these days, what is good is that we have new technologies and, um, we have city governments now, they have more experience about international cooperation and they know how to make themselves visible and stand out. They can attract other, other supporters, not only from um, fund funders alone. So in that way, I perceive this is a positive trend and I would like to ask everyone in the room, if you have a chance um, to make any decisions <laughs> regarding funding projects, please uh, consider ground projects, and also consider inviting representatives who can um, understand the local level to join the decision-making and governance mechanism. That's very important. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. I hope I, hope I answered your question. Uh, we have one more question. <laughs> Hi, it's here Anjali from the backstage. Hello. Hi, <laughs> from SEI. Um, I just would like to know about your experience um, because you have been working on the cities and many of the cities, especially the support from ASEAN that you may experience some of the funding just goes to them. I would like to know some of the cities, cities for example, that you can let us know that if there is any cities or town that they receive the fund and they become use it for us starting and then make it sustain for their projects. And if they're still doing that, is there any cities or any town that you have been working with and they still continue doing this kind of trends or this kind of activities to make it sustainable? Thank you. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm not from this side. <laughs> Yeah, Kun Anjali's question is like, if, if we provide funds, right, to the cities and they have a project, will they sustain it by themselves? Well, um, okay, my experience is, uh, let's say, this is a very broad uh, generalization. We don't expect 100% of the cities to sustain. This is not, it's not realistic at all. Um, maybe I would say 30% success rate is realistic. And um, what I see is the choking point is that now we have many, many, many pilot projects and they sort of, let's say in terms of the coverage, if we say we do waste separation at source or public participation kind of things, kind of reaches at most 10% maximum of the total city population. It cannot scale up beyond the pilot scale. This is the, the challenge we are facing and my suspicion is there must be, you know, always if you have 100 persons in the room, there will be 10 persons who are like extra passionate, extra uh, 
extra initiative to do. So we have already you know, reached that level, 10%. How can we go beyond the 10%? It's a very important question for us to answer. At some point, uh, working in, at the regional level, international level, in, in different capacity, I think that the intervention of the international organization, either Asian, ASEAN or whatever, is so important. I mean, intervention from the outside of the a certain uh, power uh, boundary is, is important. But we have to do it in such a way that the intervention trigger a bigger change process. Huh? So the activity is not an island of an activity in itself, but it trigger change. It's an intervention to spark off uh, a political process. Huh? Uh, for instance, if you're going to develop, uh, uh, you have the money to develop three cities. Huh? How can we implement the three cities in such a way that there is a national committee setting up the city be selected by the others, huh? uh, by other cities, by different institutions? So the selection is a part of the selection of the country, for instance. Huh? And then what kind of policy we would like to make a change. So it becomes more participatory, more uh, a trickling process huh? to, to a bigger change, a strategic intervention in a way. Yeah? So in this way, it's not uh, uh, an isolated different city in itself, but it is sort of linked into a whole of something uh, that they could see each other and the society see it as an opportunity to do uh, a new interesting uh, possibility because the government budget may be too restrictive, yeah? but the support from outside open up new possibility and new possibility is new possible to make bigger change or linkages or new policy uh, pos possible form of, of doing new things uh, into a society. I think for international support is so important for Asia. Uh, and it sort of open new possible intervention into the existing source, existing policy. So what are that strategic process to be designed? Yeah? Uh, and and uh, the political process be changed by that intervention. It could be small budget, it could be big budget, doesn't matter at all. Yeah? Uh, this is one, one answer. The second answer is that there are a lot of good people in, in any given country, uh, good city, good intention people, uh, some not so good, yeah, it's understandable. But how to use the possible one, the good one, to lead uh, the, the, the new, uh, new possible process, to lead the, the change, yeah? And, and to, to show new example, so the not so good or the very slow city can be a part of, yeah? So make whatever intervention in the spotlight, in the visible learning from the others. Uh, definitely, you find a lot of good people on the ground and, and how we could be a part of their change and they also be a part of a good leading process, yeah? in their country and in the region. You know, I think that that is quite exciting and it's possible to do. Yeah? Thank you. I, I think we have to wrap up now, but I would like to thank our panelists um, for um, your interventions and for sharing your cases. Um, and I think that was a nice note to end on, like even if funding or resources are really limited, you can scale up the experience and the lessons learned from implementation by networking with other cities, with other community groups, with other uh, local governments and uh, NGOs and so on, so that um, the small resources can have a broader impact uh, on a larger scale. So thank you very much uh, to our panelists um, and let's give them a round of applause.